Hello everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, chapter 4 of our nanoelectronics uh, course. Uh, today we are going to explore some fundamental uh, uh, two-terminal devices. Um, the first one will be uh, the PN junction, then we will uh, have a look at uh, uh, metal semiconductor contacts, and uh, then we will uh, have a look at uh, uh, metal oxide semiconductor systems. Um, some of you may wonder why we want to do that, and uh, the reason is extremely simple. As we have briefly explained at the very beginning of this course in Chapter 1, the aim of this course is to um, guide you through the micro nano electronic revolution and uh, in this way explore the challenges uh, of uh, shrinking the size of devices into the nanoscale. And we said that uh, we were going to explore particularly uh, the two devices that uh, best than any other represent uh, the symbol of the success of uh, the micro and nanoelectronic technology. And these were, if you remember, the MOSFET transistor and uh, the uh, flash non-volatile uh, memory. Uh, we will uh, see, obviously, in enormous details uh, this type, these devices and the challenges they are facing and so on and so forth. But uh, we should um, remind now here why we want to remind ourselves about these fundamental two-terminal devices that I've just mentioned. And the reason is very simple. Both the MOSFET uh, transistor and the non-volatile memory devices all rely on uh, PN junctions and uh, uh, MOS systems. Indeed, if we look at the um, diagram that we saw some time ago of a MOSFET transistor, we can easily recognize that the bottom part of the diagram, uh, this part here effectively, is, uh, represents uh, a piece of uh, semiconductor that has been uh, doped in a different way in some areas. These areas are the source and the drain. So if we imagine that uh, the body of the uh, piece of uh, semiconductor is, uh, was initially doped P, the source and drain would be doped, for example, N. And this immediately uh, uh, brings us to the conclusion that all around the interface existing between the source and the body uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, this piece of semiconductor, and the same here on the, with the drain, we effectively have a PN junction. Oh, at the same time, we also realize that in a transistor, there is a gate, an oxide, and uh, at the bottom, a semiconductor. So if we look at this stack here, we can immediately recognize an MOS device, a metal, an oxide, and a semiconductor. And that is why we are really interested in understanding how an MOS uh, device works. So by bringing all these little pieces together, we can then uh, uh, be able to analyze and understand the challenges uh, that are faced by uh, uh, the MOSFET transistors. But also, uh, as we will see, this will allow us to understand the flash and volatile memories, because as we will see, these are based on uh, effectively a MOSFET transistor. Before uh, we go into the details of our first uh, part uh, regarding uh, uh, PN junctions, uh, let us remind ourselves of uh, some fundamental results we've come across until now. So the first one we should remember always is that we've clarified that on, uh, on, a, on an energy uh, diagram, um, electrons move downhill while um, uh, holes uh, move uphill. One way to see this result is that uh, um, uh, since on an energy diagram we are effectively uh, plotting the, the energy of, an, uh, of our electrons, obviously they have the natural tendency to move toward states that uh, have lower energy. And so if our uh, conduction band, for example, has for any reason the shape shown here, 
then uh, uh, and and uh, for example i have an electron that is sitting in this state here then this electron would very happily uh, move in this direction in order to sit then into this state down here because it's effectively lowering its energy uh, if we mirror completely what we just said we uh, obtain what we've uh, uh, um, uh, said previously for the holes. Uh, holes will move uh, very happily uphill. Another important uh, um, concept that we should, we should uh, put in our uh, uh, minds is that uh, any non-flat region in an energy diagram indicates the presence of the presence of an electric field and uh, uh, so effectively when we see an energy diagram like this one and uh, for example we have a band that has the shape shown uh, here then in this region where there is this non-flat uh, uh, portion of the band then I should expect there an electric field that goes in this direction. And uh, the reason uh, the electric field should go in this direction is, can be uh, understood by this simple chain of uh, equalities here. So we know that from electrostatics, the electric field, I will indicate the electric, the electric field using this symbol here, the E tilde, just to distinguish it, at least on these uh, slides, from the energy. That we indicate with E. So E tilde, the electric field is a minus dB dx, and we should remember that the potential energy of an electron is QV, and so V is psi over Q, and so the electric field can be simply rewritten in this way in terms of the psi over dx. So uh, this formula is basically telling us that uh, wherever the psi over the x is non-zero, then the electric field is non-zero, and that's the the same sign of that the sign of that derivative. Derivative. So, for example, if we go back to our uh, previous uh, uh, energy diagram with a with a band, an hypothetical band that has the shape shown here, then in in the non-flat region, the derivative, uh, the slope, if you like, obtained through, in this case I've shown also the fitting line, let's say, um, uh, the derivative is uh, would give a negative value. So this means that the electric field is negative. Uh, negative, if we uh, uh, look at the uh, x reference axis that I've used. So if uh, the electric field is negative, it means that it's directed in the way that I've shown here. So it's uh, in the toward the negative side of, uh, of the uh, x-axis. So this is also a very important uh, um, result that we should always keep in mind. It will help us a lot in understanding, uh, in maybe in reading properly uh, energy band, energy diagrams. So we can link now what we just said with what we said at the beginning that electrons move downhill and holes move uphill to provide a second view or maybe a second reasoning, let's say, of why this is happening. So uh, in this case where the, um, the band, uh, the energy diagram, I had a band that is uh, uh, um, non-flat like this one, uh, then we know now that in this region there is an electric field that is directed now in the way that I've indicated here. So this means that uh, uh, using simply Coulombic uh, forces, we know now that on this electron is acting a force directed like that, which effectively um, uh, puts the electron in motion in the direction that I've shown here. And so the electron is very happily then to move downhill into this uh, uh, state down here. Similar arguments can be used for the for the hole. Another important uh, uh, <coughs> point we should uh, remember is uh, the max action law uh, that we've summarized uh, summarized by this uh, relation here. 
let me go through a very simple example to calculate a few uh, uh, numbers here just to give you an idea of uh, uh, the numbers that may be involved. So let us imagine that we are dealing with uh, um, an n-type piece of material. So this means that we have some uh, uh, density of donors, uh, the nd. Uh, let us assume that this number is 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter. So this means that in equilibrium, when we are applying no uh, voltages across the material, uh, the material is left uh, completely alone, uh, the density of uh, electrons N0, we should expect it is equal to Nd plus Ni. Here, obviously, we are working under the assumption that uh, the donors are all ionized. Recalling that Ni is, uh, for example, for silicon of the order of 10 to the 10 per cubic centimeter, then we understand that N0, the density of electron, is effectively Nd. We can then uh, calculate um, uh, the density of holes, this time using the mass action law. So uh, P0 will be equal to Ni squared over N0. We substitute the values, and so we get uh, 10 to the 20 over 10 to the 18, and so this makes uh, 10 to the 2. So while N0 was effectively 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter, we see that P0 is 10 to the 2. So there is a huge, huge mismatch between the density of electrons and the density of holes. And that's why we call, in this case, the electrons the majority carriers and the holes the minority carriers the number of holes is effectively nearly uh, and, uh, negligible. Along uh, the same lines, uh, let me remind you also that uh, while we are considering uh, doped materials, doped semiconductors, uh, these are always neutral mater materials. So charge neutrality is always valid uh, uh, when we consider uh, doped, doped materials. Just to, to emphasize this, uh, let us consider again the previous example where we had, for example, an n-type material with a, a density of donors of 10 to the 18. So we said that the density of electron uh, of electrons was uh, 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter and correspondingly through the mass action law, uh, the density of holes was uh, 10 to, of the order of 10 to the 2 per cubic centimeter. So uh, let us now try to uh, write down which is the uh, amount of negative charges we expect to find in this material. So we would expect to find the electrons that arise due to the ionization of uh, uh, the donors plus the intrinsic electrons. And correspondingly, the, mass, the number of positive charges will be the positive ions left behind because of uh, uh, the ionization of the donors, remember that these are immobile, plus the intrinsic holes. Uh, it's clear that uh, there is obvious uh, uh, charge neutrality is obviously respected in, in, uh, in this case. Another uh, um, important concept that we should uh, um, keep in mind is um, uh, that the electric field from a, a charge distribution. So in case, for example, of a 2D infinite plate that is charged, for example, with a positive surface charge sigma, then we know from uh, uh, electromagnetism that the electric field is uh, uniform throughout the space on the left and on the right of the plate, and uh, its intensity is constant throughout the space and is equal to this value here. And also, uh, if uh, uh, we have a point charge, a positive point charge, the electric field has a, a, a radial distribution around uh, the charge in, in all directions. Okay, let us now have a look uh, at uh, the PN junction. 
Uh, here we will uh, uh, particularly consider a very simple uh, situation that is the abrupt PN, uh, PN junction, so made by a P plus side and uh, uh, an N side. So this means that we will be at a certain point uh, be assuming that the P side is much more doped, has much more impurities than the N side. Both are doped, but the P side is much more heavily doped than the N. For now, let us uh, uh, stay just on the PN junction uh, and try to understand exactly what is happening. So to, to do that, uh, let us um, consider uh, a, a, a very simple diagram uh, as this one here, uh, where we have our P uh, piece of material, where we have uh, immobile negative charges and free uh, positive charges, our free holes. And on uh, the end type uh, material, we have uh, uh, correspondingly uh, immobile positive charges and um, uh, free negative ones. So when we bring the P type material in contact, in intimate contact with uh, the N type material, what happens is that those char free charges that are very, very close to the interface, because they have opposite sign, will annihilate. This means that there will be a region around the interface of the PN junction where there will be effectively no free carriers. So a region in a device where there are no free carriers is called a depletion region. So in this case, our depletion region is uh, this one uh, here. Oh, please note that uh, charge neutrality is still maintained throughout my PN junction. As you can see on the left, positive and negative charges are still very well balanced. Also on the right of the PN junction, the positive and negative charges are very well balanced. And even within the depletion uh, region, even if there are no free carriers anymore, the immobile charges are perfect, perfectly balanced. The only thing is that now there is a local anisotropy in charge distribution. The negative charges uh, within the depletion region are all on the left, while the positive charges are all here. And we will shall discuss now what this implies. So uh, let us uh, uh, have a look uh, uh, to uh, the specific case we wanted to discuss, uh, which was the uh, abrupt PN junction, which is the P plus N. So the P plus N is, uh, the, uh, could be represented uh, uh, graphically in the way that I've, uh, I've done here. So we can see that the P plus side is very heavily doped. There are a lot of uh, um, acceptor dopants that uh, uh, provide free positive uh, carriers holes, while on the end side there are much less uh, impurities, uh, much less uh, uh, donors here. So, for example, we could say that on this side we have uh, 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter uh, impurities, while here we could have, for example, 10 to the 16 per cubic centimeter. So in this case, what will happen is that, again, uh, very close to the interface, the free carriers will annihilate those from the left and those from the right in equal numbers. Uh, but because of this um, different doping, doping level, uh, the depletion region effectively will extend much more into the end side, the side that is, has a lower doping level. So this uh, assumption simplifies much more the analysis. That's why we are uh, doing, uh, uh, doing it here. So effectively, we can assume that the depletion layer extends only into one of the two sides. And that's, that's why we are making this assumption. Oh, 
Let us now have a look, as we anticipated previously to the implications of this charge separation that happens, existing maybe, within the depletion region. So we have immobile charges that are negative on the, right, on the left hand side of the, of the depletion region, while there are um, uh, positive immobile charges on the right hand side of the depletion region, into the hand side. So, very briefly, I would like now to show you, using very simple electrostatic uh, concepts uh, and results, how we can quickly evaluate uh, the electric field throughout this uh, charge distribution. Uh, before we do that, let us remind that if we have uh, a surface distribution of uh, uh, negative charges, the electric field lines will go like that. And here we will use the notation that because this is given by, uh, you know, six charges, we will use the the uh, formulas I've used here. So E tilde, remember the tilde is used to indicate the electric field so that we don't confuse it with the energy, uh, and, and six minus. In the, in, 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 and this is to uh, mean that uh, um, the intensity of the electric field is the proportional to, at least in this diagram, to six uh, uh, charges that we see in the diagram. And uh, uh, similar arguments are valid for the case of a positive uh, uh, charge distribution. Let us imagine uh, to place ourselves in this point here, in point x1, at uh, x equal x1. And uh, uh, we, we, we could imagine to uh, uh, try to probe um, the electric field originating from the charge distribution existing on our left. Obviously, we know that here the, the total charge is effectively zero. So, effectively, in this point, the electric field arising from the charge distribution existing on our uh, left is zero. The same we could say holds for what we see from our right. Uh, uh, the total charge that we see in front of us, if we look to our right, is effectively 12 negative charges, but also 12 positive charges. So overall, the total charge is zero. So in good approximation, we could say that uh, in this point, the total uh, electric field arising from a total charge that is effectively zero will be zero. So in X1, uh, we have a total electric field that is zero. So we place this dot here. Let us imagine now to place ourselves in this point here, a point x equal x2. So if we are in this point and we look to our left, we see now six negative charges. So we could imagine that on this point, the electric field will be directed in this way. This is because we have six negative charges, so it must be directed toward the negative charges. And the intensity is uh, of six negative charges, if we follow the formalism we, we set. Uh, uh, if we now look to our uh, right, uh, we see that there are 12 positive charges, but these are shielded by six negative charges. So in total, we have an equivalent of six positive charges. And so the electric field coming from the right is this one here. In total, we have uh, uh, 12 the we can see that these two uh, electric fields point in the same direction effectively. The intensity is the equivalent of 6 for each of those, and so uh, the total is 12. So we could, in whichever units are these, we could uh, place our point, second point, here. We can move on. And now that we understood how this works, we can go quickly to point x equal x3. And uh, uh, this is the point where the electric, total electric field effectively is maximum. So on our left, we, set, we see 12 chargers, negative charges. And so we have the electric field uh, E, L, 
12 minus, and then on our right, we see 12 positive charges. And so uh, uh, a total of, uh, in the, the equivalent intensity of the total uh, field is uh, uh, minus 24. Or remember that uh, uh, we are, uh, the field is pointing toward the negative side of the uh, x -axis, axis. So this means that, if you remember, as we said previously, this means that the electric field is effectively negative and so on and so forth. So uh, when we are at x equal to 4, x, x4, we get uh, um, uh, a total electric field of uh, minus 18. If we move to x equal x5, we get a total electric field of minus 12. And uh, finally, in x equal x6, uh, a total field of minus 6. And finally, once we go beyond again the depletion region, because of the charge neutrality, as we said, the total electric field there will be also zero. And so we can now uh, uh, qualitatively, if you like, plot the shape of our electric field. That should be the one that I've shown you here. Now that we have the electric field, because we know that the electric field is related to the electric potential V, the voltage, uh, through this uh, derivative, then we can uh, uh, reverse this relation and calculate uh, the electric potential by integrating the electric field. Uh, we integrate it from minus infinity to a hypothetical point X tilde, and so we can calculate um, uh, V at this point X tilde by changing the sign of the area under the electric field. So if we imagine that this was our hypothetical x tilde point, then we should effectively calculate this area here. This area obviously will be negative, but we need to change the sign so it will be positive. And so we understand that we get this value here of the of the uh, electric potential V. So we understand that while the electric field has this shape across the depletion region, uh, the electric, vo electric potential across our device is effectively uh, changing in this way. And so this means that uh, at the far right end of the N uh, semiconductor, the electric potential is actually VBI, what we call VBI, the built-in potential. So this uh, built-in potential is caused because of the depletion layer. And that's why we call it built-in potential. So now that we know that there is um, potential across our uh, device, and we know that Psi is related to the electric potential, Psi is the potential energy of the electrons, this effectively means that there is some non-flat band behavior within our energy diagram of this device. So uh, when we form our PN junction, uh, we should expect that uh, the conduction band has uh, this uh, shape here, where the mismatch between the conduction band in the P plus side and the N side is exactly QVBI, is the potential energy induced by uh, the uh, built-in potential VBI. Oh, similar happens to the valence band. Because in this uh, situation, we are applying no external bias to our device, the Fermi level across the entire device is flat. You remember we've mentioned uh, uh, before this important fundamental condition that must apply also here. So the Fermi level, as you can see, is completely flat across the entire device, both in the P-type uh, material and in the N-type material. And this is because uh, at this point, uh, the, the, our uh, device is uh, at rest uh, in equilibrium and uh, we are not applying any external bias to it.
So the results that uh, we've just gone through are summarized, as you can see here. And uh, because we've been talking about the existence of a depletion layer, a depletion layer where there are no free carriers, so effectively uh, uh, the P injunction in presence of a depletion layer effectively behaves as a capacitor. And this is something that we will uh, uh, have to keep in mind always when we are dealing with a depletion layer. But uh, the first, uh, first of all, let us quantify the uh, um, depletion layer. So if we um, consider extremely simple um, arguments, uh, uh, you know, the immobile charges that we've uh, uh, mentioned before, uh, we solve the Poisson equation, uh, then we can easily demonstrate that uh, the width of um, uh, the depletion layer, as we said, in, for the device in equilibrium with no external bias, is uh, given by this formula here, where LD is uh, this term here, and this is uh, called the, the by length, Please note that in the uh, term called LD, uh, this term here, NB, is the effectively the density of uh, impurities in the side of the junction that has the lowest uh, dopant density. So in our case of a P plus N junction, this would be the density of uh, uh, donor impurities. Well, in case we now apply some bias across our um, P N junction, the depletion layer will be affected. And the way it is affected is effectively um, Describe, discussed maybe very briefly here. So in order to understand uh, what would be the depletion layer when you apply some voltage across uh, the PN junction, then you have to substitute VBI with uh, effectively this term here. But to understand a bit more in detail uh, the why and what should we should expect when we start applying uh, an external bias across our uh, structure. Uh, let us uh, uh, consider our very simple here diagram. So we have our P plus N junction. We know we have a depletion layer region. We know there is an internal, uh, a built-in electric field. Uh, and uh, uh, we want now to understand what happens when we apply uh, an external bias. So in this uh, case, we are considering that uh, the external bias is zero. If we now apply a positive bias according to the to the uh, to the drawing I've made here, so the positive uh, side is uh, is uh, connected to the P plus. Uh, and the negative side of our battery is connected to the end side. Oh, this type of uh, connection is also called uh, forward biased PN junction. Then what we will uh, we we know is that uh, uh, by applying here a high a higher voltage than here, then we should expect an electric field that is directed in the way that I've shown here everywhere, in all sections of uh, my device. So there is an electric field uh, directed like that in the uh, bulk of the P plus region, uh, an electric field directed like that into the depletion uh, layer, and uh, an electric field directed like that in the bulk of the N uh, side. Now this immediately lets us understand that within the depletion region, this electric field is effectively fighting against the built-in uh, uh, electric field. This means that in, in the depletion region now, the total electric field will be smaller, will not be anymore as intense as it used to be, probably will still be directed in the same direction, but will be in total smaller. So the total electric field tau now will be uh, uh, much smaller. This means that the width of the depletion region will reduce. 
so in the forward bias uh, in the forward biased uh, PN conjunction we will expect the depletion region to decrease as I've um, drawn here and eventually even disappear at a certain point if we now consider the opposite case of a, of a negatively biased PN junction so this is also called uh, reverse biased uh, PN junction what we have to expect is that now the uh, we are applying uh, remember uh, a negative voltage on uh, so the the negative voltage will be here so the, the point with a higher voltage will actually now be on the other side and so the electric field now is that the, the external electric field is directed in the way i've shown here and so now in this case now this means that within the depletion region the total electric field <coughs> is now uh, uh, more than the initially existing built-in electric field and so this means that uh, the depletion region will now actually increase as I've uh, uh, drawn here so for a reverse biased PN junction the depletion region increases in width and so uh, although qualitatively we can now understand why we got this formula here where the uh, depletion width of the depletion layer depends on the effectively on the external bias V in the way that is uh, indicated here so as we anticipated previously when we looked at the forward bias uh, uh, case there must exist a positive bias V star such that the depletion region is effectively zero we can see it also from uh, from the formula here and from that point on the depletion region will remain zero there will be no no depletion region or oh, this uh, um, v star potential indicates the situation uh, that we should call flat band so and the reason is that we've now linked the existence of a depletion layer to the existence of an electric field within our device and the existence of an electric field we have shown that is related to non-flat regions of a band in our energy diagram and so this means that if there is no depletion layer then there is no built-in electric field and so I should expect that the bands are flat and this is exactly what I'm uh, effectively uh, telling you here just to um, see this uh, so I've got you here the energy diagram of our PN junction with no external bias so this is in um, when our device is in equilibrium but as we said when uh, V is equal to this V star positive electric potential then this means effectively that we are applying a positive potential here and a negative potential here then when we apply a positive potential to this end of our um, device we need to pull effectively as we if you remember we have to pull that uh, uh, side toward down and that's exactly what is happening here as you see by an amount q v star and so q v star effectively makes both the conduction band and the valence band flat So, and this is the condition that we call flat band. We, we can have a look now at uh, um, values that uh, the depletion layer could take, uh, depending on the external bias applied and also on the on the doping density uh, of the of the end side. Uh, in our case, uh, so. 
for example, uh, uh, the the curve here corresponding to um, the device in equilibrium is the one uh, here in, shown with a dashed line. So if we, for example, focus for a moment to uh, the case of NB, which as we said, that this is a, in our case of a P plus N junction is actually the density uh, of dopants in the N side. So this is effectively ND. So if you forgot to uh, a value 10 to the 16, so in, um, in, uh, in a, when the device is in equilibrium, we should expect a uh, um, depletion layer of this uh, uh, width just below a micron effectively. If we now um, apply a negative bias, so we reverse bias the junction, we can see that the depletion width is moving in this direction. So at 10 volts we are here and at 100 volts we would be here. So we are moving you know, toward 10 micrometers of uh, uh, depletion layer width. If we on the other hand apply, uh, uh, we forward bias the junction, we move in this direction. And so we reach, for example, this point here, where the effectively the width is 100 nanometers. Another interesting, <coughs> another interesting uh, question that we would like to address is, uh, uh, if we apply a bias across our device, what kind of current we should expect? So uh, imagine that we work in the uh, in this uh, framework here. So we uh, apply our voltage uh, um, across our device, and um, the current uh, would flow in this way. Uh, we, in general, we should expect that uh, in, in our PN junction there are two. Um, major mechanisms at, at play. The first one is one that we already know that we call the drift. And this is the, the uh, due to the Coulombic motion of uh, charged carriers uh, immersed in an, uh, in an electric field. So if our electric field, for example, is uh, like the one that I've drawn here, then we should expect that electrons move uh, more or less in this direction opposite to the direction of the electric field, while holes would move in the same direction of the electric field. And so, if we are in a forward bias condition, so we are applying a, a positive voltage on the P side and a negative voltage on the N side, then we should expect that the electric field in our device is the one that I've indicated here in, with this uh, direction. And so, under the influence of this electric field, then what is moving across the junction is the, are the holes from the P side into, moving into the N side, and the electrons from the N side into, moving into the, the P side. Oh, please note the formalism that I've uh, uh, used here uh, to indicate uh, uh, the charge carriers and uh, to separate, to distinguish them also uh, between P and N side. So, as you can see, uh, the whole density in the P side is indicated as P, P, while the electron density in the P side is indicated as N, P. Similarly, for the N side, the whole density in the N side is Pn, while the electron density in the N side is Nm. So we can see that here is uh, uh, the Pp that can move toward the N side and Nn that can move toward the P side. So effectively, in forward bias, due to drift, we would expect uh, uh, that the current is given by the majority carriers. Now, if we look now at the reverse bias situation, uh, the, we should expect an electric field across my device that is directed in this way. And so uh, we should expect that are the holes now in the N side that move toward the P side and are the electrons 
in the P side that move into the N side. As we can see, these are these charges that are moving are the minority carriers. And as we know, as we've seen in our example that we made previously at the very beginning, uh, when we are talking of you know doped or heavily doped semiconductors, the minority carrier density is extremely low. So we can already anticipate that in a reverse bias situation, the drift current cause uh, arising from uh, uh, the movement of the minority carriers will be effectively uh, negligible. Uh, and uh, the reason is that there is another mechanism at, at play that plays a role both in the forward bias but also in the um, mainly in the reverse bias and this is the diffusion of uh, carriers and uh, the, the diffusion that we want to consider here is a uh, diffusion related to the gradient of concentration that we have. So, and the, this concentration gradient is the concentration gradient of electrons and of uh, holes that we know must be huge because uh, on the P side, the majority carriers that are represented by PP have a, have a very large density compared to the density of the holes in the inside. So we expect that uh, those uh, charges will tend to diffuse toward the inside. And similarly, the uh, electron density on the inside is extremely large as compared to the electron density on the P side. And so we should expect that the electrons will have a tendency to diffuse toward the P side. Now, what we've just said is obviously extremely qualitative. So in order to qualify it a bit more, uh, let us have a, a look at the uh, uh, the energy diagram in uh, uh, in the different situations we've discussed: reverse bias uh, and forward bias. So, if we let let us consider first of all the reverse bias situation. For comparison uh, reasons, I've put here also the uh, case of our device in uh, in equilibrium. So when uh, uh, we are in a reverse bias situation, when the voltage across the device is negative, so this means that uh, the, the voltage on the P side is smaller than that on the N side. So what we have to do uh, when we apply a negative bias to a any part of our uh, energy diagram, as we said, we have to pull that side up. And as you can see, that's what is happening here. So uh, uh, the, the P side is moving upward by a quantity QV. Now, let us have a look at the uh, new conduction band. As you can see, because of the presence of this external bias, now the mismatch between the conduction band energy in the P side and the, the one in the, in the N side is even larger. If we consider an electron, a minority carrier in the P side, this electron, as we said, will happily move downhill. So we know that this electron will definitely want to move in this direction. On the other hand, the majority, the majority carriers in the N side, the uh, N, N electrons that are here, they obviously cannot uh, move uphill. And so uh, this uh, um, process is uh, obviously forbidden in this case. Uh, using similar arguments, we can see that the minority carriers in the end side will happily move the holes, will happily move uphill here, while the majority carriers on the on the uh, P side uh, will not be allowed to move downhill. Uh, and so, uh, uh, as we uh, also said uh, qualitatively previously, uh, in the case of a reverse bias, uh, we expect uh, the drift of minority carriers, but again, we said they are extremely few in numbers, and also diffusion. And so we 
should expect that diffusion may be more relevant, more important, should probably dominate uh, uh, in, the re in the reverse bias case. Because, as we uh, said previously, uh, the diffusion term relates to the diffusion gradient, to the, to the concentration gradient. And between N and P side, the concentration gradients, both for electrons and for holes, are huge. So that's why uh, uh, I'm saying that we can already anticipate that diffusion, at least in the reverse bias situation, uh, should play a very domin important role. Now, uh, let us uh, imagine now to, uh, uh, that we are applying a slightly positive bias. And to, for slightly positive, I mean positive, but such that V is still smaller than VBI. So this is obviously a forward bias situation, but uh, because of this extra uh, uh, condition I've uh, considered here, uh, this means that effectively the band, the, the energy diagram should look something like that. So still there is a, um, the conduction band energy on the P side is above, as you can see, the one on the N side. So this means that still uh, it's only the majority so, excuse me, it's only the minority carriers from the P side that will happily move again downhill here, while the majority carriers on the N side uh, are forbidden yet to move uphill here. But because now uh, this gap has obviously been decreased if we compare to this situation, this means that there may be some electrons of the many, remember that on this side we have a lot of electrons, they are majority carriers, so there will be few electrons, some electrons, that have uh, enough energy to reach these states up here. And if that's the case, these electrons will be able to move in this direction. So this means that similar arguments apply to the holes. Okay, so in order to understand this point, we need to think that the electrons, or anyway, the charge carriers above um, the conduction band or above the valence band, if we're talking about the holes, are distributed according to the Fermi distribution. Okay, and so we can understand already that if we are in, the, in, in this situation here, even if we are in a forward bias condition, with a, with a small voltage, then we could expect, simply because the majority carriers here are really a lot, we could expect that because of this mechanism that uh, we are suggesting here, that the current could now start increasing reasonably because of drift. So, uh, just to summarize, in, in this case, we have we expect drift of minority carriers, but also potentially some majority carriers. And obviously still diffusion, that's always there. And finally, let us consider the case of, uh, of uh, quite large positive bias. So, in this case, uh, uh, what we are doing, remember, is pushing downward the, the P side. Uh, and so this means that we are in the situation that uh, now I've drawn here. So we've pushed the P side down so much that now the, the bands are bent in the way that I've drawn here. So now uh, the, are the electrons on the end side that are very happily moving uh, downhill. Uh, the minority carriers that are on the P side here are obviously forbidden to move uphill. And so here we are in a clear situation where uh, there is clearly drift of majority carriers, both electrons from the end side to P and also holes from the P to the end side. And still obviously diffusion. But probably here, because uh, we said that the drift here is uh, um, related to the movement of, uh, of um, uh, the majority carriers, 
we may suspect here that the dominant mechanism will be um, uh, the drift of majority carriers, just because the majority carriers is really a huge number, as we said previously. And so we can summarize here now the uh, uh, results. Uh, so um, if we, we were to write down the uh, current density relating, uh, related to uh, concerning the electrons, uh, we would write it as we anticipated previously with a term related to drift and a term related to uh, diffusion. Uh, obviously for the holes something similar is true and so the total current will be given by uh, jp plus jn and we can demonstrate that finally uh, the current density through my pn junction can takes the form that i've shown here this is called the shockley equation where uh, uh, note that the voltage appears on this uh, exponent here so uh, the current has somewhere an exponential behavior and uh, uh, js is uh, uh, effectively a term that depends from uh, terms that are uh, uh, related to diffusion um, and these are described here as you can see so lp is the diffusion length uh, and d is the diffusion coefficient and um, as we anticipated, because of the presence of uh, a depletion layer, we should expect that uh, we have a capacitance that we can calculate in this way. Most importantly, here is shown the plot of the current voltage characteristic of our uh, device. So as you can see in forward bias, the current increases really a lot uh, exponentially and uh, the reason is that as we've seen previously in forward bias when is the, the device is uh, heavily forward biased basically we have drift of majority carriers from one side to the other while in reverse bias as you can see uh, drift basically plays no role and what plays the role here is actually the diffusion and as you can see uh, the j is effectively minus js where js was the constant that we found previously that depends on diffusion let us have a look now at the metal semiconductor system in the previous slides we have uh, considered the dev a device the pin junction made by uh, effectively a single piece of a semiconductor that was doped P on one side and then one side, but effectively it was the same piece of material. Uh, for the first time here, we consider um, a device that is made actually from two completely different materials. On one side, we have a metal, and on the other side, we have a, a semiconductor. So in general, uh, what we should expect is that the Fermi level of uh, the metal and the Fermi level of uh, the semiconductor don't match. And this is what uh, we are indicating here. So uh, what we have to uh, um, try to understand now is what happens when we bring uh, our metal and our semiconductor uh, uh, um, in contact together. So in this uh, diagram here, what we are imagining is a, a hypothetical uh, uh, situation where we have the metal and the semiconductor separated by vacuum and then we uh, uh, start bringing them closer and closer to each other until they touch. And they're effectively creating a, a proper interface and they make a device. The presence of a, a mismatch between uh, the Fermi levels is of, of course uh, something that uh, uh, has to be resolved. Otherwise, uh, we cannot create a, the device. As we've said, when we create a device, the Fermi level has to be the same throughout the device if the device is in equilibrium and there is no external bias applied to it. So in the case that we've uh, drawn here uh, in this diagram, uh, what has to happen is that, for example, the Fermi level on the uh, semiconductor side has to decrease in order to match the one on the, on the metal side. 
So effectively, what we are re uh, requesting the semiconductor to do is at least locally near the uh, um, uh, very interface that it will create with the metal, we want it to become slightly less n-type. So in this case, as we've drawn here, this is an n-type semiconductor. The Fermi lever is very close to the conduction band. So what we are requesting effectively the semiconductor to do is to uh, lose some charge, at least locally, very, very close to the interface in, the, in such a way that effectively it is less n-type, maybe even becomes slightly p-type. And that's exactly what is happening here. Obviously, in the bulk of the material, the semiconductor has to remain n-type. And so this effectively means that the bands of my semiconductor have to bend to represent that. As you can see, uh, down here in the bulk, the separation between the Fermi lever and the, and the conduction band is exactly what we had at the very beginning here. So the semiconductor, excuse me, the semiconductor is in the bulk uh, n-type, but we can see that for the Fermi levels to match, now at the very, very interface with the metal, the semiconductor has a Fermi level that is much farther from the conduction band and much closer to the valence band. So this means that at least at the very, very interface, my uh, semiconductor is not anymore so n-type, possibly is even now slightly p. Oh, I would like you to note that in this process, what effectively is happening is that the mismatch between the Fermi levels that we have highlighted here by this error is effectively translated into the band bending of uh, the bands in the semiconductor. Please note that uh, in this whole process, uh, there are some uh, points that remain uh, uh, locked in position. And, uh, and this is a very important point that we need to highlight. And this point is the relative position of the conduction band edge and the valence band edge as compared to the Fermi level in the metal. If you notice, this distance here, and the same can be said for the distance with the valence band, has remained effectively the same in the whole process. Okay, this is a very important point. This is highlighted in the diagram by the fact that uh, the this green arrow that I've drawn here is effectively QFM minus QH, according to the formulas uh, in this diagram. And so, as you can see, is exactly what you find here. So the barrier between uh, uh, the metal and the uh, conduction band in the semiconductor is effectively the same as the one that uh, we would have seen here. Oh, this is a, a very important uh, concept and uh, and uh, as we've uh, uh, explained uh, it is only possible because uh, the semiconductor decreases its fermi energy at least locally very close to the interface by effectively depleting away some majority carriers that's what is happening so these uh, uh, majority carriers are either uh, moved to the right into the bulk or are even um, um, shared uh, with, uh, with the metal. So, in, in one way or the other, there is uh, um, band bending, and so we've learned now that this band bending is uh, uh, related with the existence of uh, um, some uh, electric field, and in this specific case, as we've uh, highlighted just now, it means that we have a depletion layer as well. So, um, what we want now to understand is what happens to this special uh, two-terminal device, our metal semiconductor device, 
uh, when we apply some uh, voltage to it, different from zero. Uh, here I've drawn uh, uh, the energy diagram of the device when we are at V equal zero. So we want now to understand what happens when uh, V is not zero anymore. Well, as you can see in this band diagram, I've uh, tried to highlight the points that uh, we've uh, seen uh, a moment ago. So uh, because of the band bending, effectively, we have the uh, majority carriers in the in our semiconductor that in this case is n-type so our electrons are uh, depleted away uh, maybe there are some minority carriers that are uh, happily moving uphill here and so they are slightly uh, accumulating in the proximity of the interface but overall they are obviously uh, um, so little in density that uh, we can uh, um, safely uh, say that uh, this is our uh, effective deplet depletion region so let us have a look at what happens now if we start applying a voltage across this uh, device. What happens to the uh, um, energy diagram of this device? So uh, on the top, I've uh, again drawn the situation that corresponds to V equal zero, just for comparison purposes. So let us now have a look at what happens when V is uh, smaller than zero. So we know uh, we've uh, seen it now many times when uh, we apply a negative bias to the metal, the uh, metal side, the energy uh, diagram that corresponds to the metal side has to be pushed upward, as we've indicated here. Oh, please note that, that we, as I stressed uh, initially, the relative position of this point of the conduction band at the interface and the valence band at the interface and so the relative position with the relative position with the uh, uh, um, uh, Fermi level of the metal these have to remain locked whatever happens to the device so this means that when we say we pull upward the uh, um, energy diagram corresponding to just the metal side effectively we have to pull together also these points here. So this means effectively that we are increasing the band bending throughout um, the device in this case. And this is uh, highlighted by this uh, red arrow here that if we compare it with uh, uh, the red arrow in the in the V equal zero case is now much, much uh, bigger. And so this means we have much larger bending of our uh, bands. So this means effectively that if we look now at this uh, uh, energy diagram, while the bulk is uh, very n is is um, is n type as uh, um, our semiconductor was at the very beginning, now the interface is effectively p because the bending now is such that the Fermi level is actually approaching and maybe even uh, uh, going through the valence band. And so this means that now the few minor minority carriers is existing in the bulk also of my uh, semiconductor are attracted. They happily move uphill, we remember. So they will accumulate at the interface. So uh, effectively, we can see now that uh, uh, in this situation, when V is negative, uh, we are effectively inverting the type of uh, our semiconductor, at least at the very interface. This is called, as we will see uh, several times later, an inversion situation. So the bulk of the material is still N, but the interface effectively is P. And this is due to the very few minority carriers that uh, exist in our uh, semiconductor, but because they are now accumulating in a very, very small uh, space, they effectively, uh, um, their local density can be quite large. And actually, as shown here, the Fermi level is actually passing through the valence band. So this means that we are in a heavily P situation. Or oh, here we can uh, also highlight a potential additional uh, uh, empirical rule, if you like, uh, where uh, we could say that when charge 
in, uh, in the bands of a semiconductor accumulates to one interface, then this will cause further uh, band bending. It could be obviously the it could be read in the opposite uh, way that when we have band bending, uh, uh, then charges accumulate, and this is actually the way we've been uh, reading this uh, phenomenon up until now. But we could use it also the other way around, and this we will see that this sometimes is useful. Let us consider now the case where instead we apply a slightly positive bias to the metal gate, to the metal of our uh, device. So in this case, uh, we have to push downward uh, the Fermi level of our, uh, of our metal. And so effectively what is happening is that uh, the band bending is uh, uh, reduced, as we can see in, in the drawing, which means that the electrons that originally were uh, depleted from uh, uh, the, the interface are now starting to come back toward the interface. And if we continue increasing the uh, positive voltage and we go to in a situation where the voltage is quite positive now, then we can actually push the metals down enough that effectively the band bending is uh, uh, inversed, if you like. And so uh, the band bending is such now that uh, the uh, electrons happily will uh, move downhill and will accumulate to the interface now. As you can see, uh, this situation uh, uh, means that uh, the interface is uh, not just N anymore, it's actually heavily doped N, or equivalent to a heavily doped N. This is highlighted, if you look, by the fact that now the Fermi level is not just below the conduction band, but is actually passing through the conduction band is above the conduction band. This denotes the fact that the, the local density of electrons is extremely high now. So that's why I mentioned N plus. By recalling the uh, previous result for V positive and, uh, and uh, looking at this uh, result now when v is, v is quite large and positive, then uh, immediately we can realize that there must exist also in this case a potential V star positive such that effectively the bands in the silicon, uh, in the, the semiconductor side are effectively flat. And so this uh, situation is uh, called uh, again uh, flat bands situation. So here we can summarize uh, uh, the results we've uh, just seen for an n-type semiconductor and uh, uh, accordingly you can see also what happens uh, for, uh, um, for a p-type semiconductor and uh, we've said that uh, uh, um, also for uh, an MS uh, device uh, we have a depletion layer and so the depletion we discalculated in a way that is actually extremely similar to uh, the abrupt PN junction. As you can see the formula is uh, uh, exactly similar to that with similar uh, dependence from the biases. And we can also calculate uh, the depletion capacitance uh, and the formula is uh, given down here. So um, and it takes this uh, extremely simple form here where epsilon s is the dielectric constant of the semiconductor and w is the depletion uh, layer. Oh, as you can see, obviously, uh, similarly to what we've done with the p-junction, uh, the depletion layer depends on the uh, voltage we are applying across the device. The question now is, if we apply a voltage across uh, our metal semiconductor device, what type of current should we expect? So if we plot the uh, relation existing be between uh, the current and the voltage applied across the device, we should come uh, across a curve like the one that I've shown here, where I've plotted the current in the ordinate and the voltage in the abscissa. So uh, the striking feature of this uh, plot is that clearly this is a non homic behavior and it's extremely asymmetric. 
So uh, the non-homic behavior means that um, uh, is not behaving uh, in the same way that we would expect, for example, a resistor to behave. A resistor is uh, uh, the type of device. Excuse me. Is the type of device that uh, would give a straight line, where the slope of this curve is obviously one over r. This is uh, um, obviously arises from Ohm's law. So this would be, uh, by definition, the homic case, homic behavior. So in our case, we have clearly a non-homic behavior, so heavily non-linear curves, and is also asymmetric. So the why this is asymmetric uh, can be understood by, again, having a look at the, at the energy diagrams. So in the forward case, uh, uh, we, ha we have a, an energy diagram that looks something like that. And so um, the current passing through the device, through the device is uh, driven by uh, um, the majority carriers that are obviously really a lot in the conduction uh, band of the semiconductor that are passing into the metal. So the more we increase the voltage, uh, the more uh, electrons will be able to uh, um, populate the conduction band of the material in the region close to the interface. Remember that the Fermi energy is like that. So the more we increase the voltage, the more the Fermi energy uh, crosses above the conduction band, at least very close to the interface. And so this means that all these states below the Fermi level are heavily populated. And so uh, the current increases effectively exponentially now. And that's why it has this behavior here. When we go to the uh, reversed bias uh, condition, so for the negative side of this uh, uh, of the v-axis here, um, we should expect initially at least uh, very low currents, and uh, the reason is that uh, um, the, the the energy diagram in this uh, biasing condition would look something like that. And in this condition are the minority carriers that uh, would happily be moving uh, from the right hand side to the to the left. But remember, the minority carriers are extremely few, so their contribution to the current is extremely small. If the bias we apply though is uh, quite uh, uh, negative, what we can happen at a certain point is that, uh, as we can see here, the current can actually start to increase quite abruptly. And the reason is that the electrons in the metal at a certain point may uh, uh, be able to either tunnel through this uh, effectively nearly triangular barrier or uh, they may acquire enough energy, thermal energy, to actually go around the barrier that they see in front of them. And this is what we call a shot key emission that we will discuss in the next chapter. This is also the reason why uh, uh, sometimes you may see that this type of contacts, M, S contacts, are also referred to as uh, shot key contacts or shot key device. Okay, um, let us uh, uh, consider now uh, the MOS system, so uh, a metal oxide semiconductor device, as shown in this uh, diagram here. Oh, um, in uh, in uh, what we will see uh, in the next few slides, uh, what we will, uh, uh, and as we've done in the case of uh, the uh, MS devices and the PN junction, we would like to understand what happens when we apply a voltage across this device. Oh, first of all, um, uh, in this diagram, down here, you can see the energy diagram of uh, this device, the metal on the left, the insulator in the middle, and uh, the semiconductor on the right. And um, 
the symbols defined here will be used uh, throughout. Uh, please note that uh, um, for this uh, uh, a symbol here, I've also used the symbol PCF. So uh, a PCF or PCB indicate uh, the separation existing between the Fermi level, the, the actual Fermi level in the semiconductor we are considering, and the intrinsic level of that semiconductor. Remember that the intrinsic level is effectively the Fermi level of the undoped semiconductor and effectively lies in the middle of the band gap. Oh, for simplicity, in order to understand how this device works, what we will do is uh, we will uh, make a simplifying assumption, at least at the beginning, that we will actually drop at a certain point. And this is that the uh, metal, the insulator, and the semiconductor all have the same Fermi level. So, uh, as you can see, when there is no bias applied in the in this uh, device, no external bias applied, uh, the Fermi levels are all intrinsically leveled, which means there is no bad bending, at least at, at, at equilibrium conditions. So this simplifying assumption is helpful, at least in the beginning, to understand what is happening. Uh, we will then drop it later on and see what, uh, what uh, happens. So um, as shown in the diagram here, similarly to what uh, we've seen already with uh, metal semiconductor contacts uh, for both uh, P-type and N-type semiconductors, in an MOS device, we should expect three situations. The first one where uh, majority carriers are accumulated to the interface with the oxide. Uh, another one that we've seen also with metal semiconductor contacts that we call inversion where the minority carriers are accumulated at the interface and uh, uh, another one that sits in between that is uh, uh, when we effectively have uh, a depleted uh, uh, interface. So um, let us have a look uh, more in detail to uh, um, what happens uh, in this type of device. So I've drawn here again the uh, band dia the, the energy diagram of our device in equilibrium, so when there is no external bias. So this situation, as you can see, has uh, is characterized by the fact that uh, the Fermi level is uh, uh, the same throughout the device and uh, uh, our simplifying assumption means that this situation also corresponds to a flat band condition. Or we will see that this flat band condition is characterized in the MOS device by uh, uh, this condition here, Cs equals zero, where Cs is a new uh, uh, parameter that we will define in a moment. And this called surface potential, as we will see. Oh, uh, please note that uh, in this case we are uh, we will imagine that we are dealing uh, for simplicity for simplicity with a p silicon uh, semiconductor. And uh, uh, remember that just uh, for curiosity, uh, MOS, which means uh, M metal oxide semiconductor, sometimes is also generalized uh, uh, as a MIS. So metal insulator semiconductor, but effectively they are used uh, um, in exactly the same way. So let us consider uh, uh, initially the case of uh, uh, a potential V applied to the metal of our uh, um, semiconductor of our MOS device that is negative. Or in, in everything we do here, we always assume that we are applying, as we did also for the pin junction and the MEMS contact, we always assume that the voltage we are applying is applied to the, to the metal, uh, in the case of the MS uh, contact, or to the P, junk, P, P silicon, uh, if it was uh, the case of the pin junction. So in, also in this case, we are assuming that we are applying the voltage to the metal, while the semiconductor in this case, we assume has a, a zero potential. So, if we're applying a negative, bi a negative uh, bias to the metal, we know that we have to push upward the, the uh, energy diagram of the metal side. 
obviously, as we've uh, already seen in the uh, metal semiconductor contacts, we have to pull together, to pull upward also the uh, interface, if you like, with the oxide now, so that these uh, uh, distances here, these barriers, are maintained uh, uh, throughout the process. So we are pulling upward uh, this entire part of uh, our uh, um, uh, energy diagram. So this means that now uh, what we are bending is uh, uh, we, we are, by pulling upward to this side of the energy diagram, we are pulling uh, uh, the, 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 the oxide, but also uh, the semiconductor. We keep this side uh, effectively there because there the potential is zero, so this is not changing. So this effectively means that uh, a portion of the uh, uh, potential difference we are applying across the device, that is V, a portion of that will uh, be found across the oxide and a portion across the semiconductor. The one that is found across the semiconductor is the one that is going to cause the bending of the bands. And this is what uh, we um, highlight with uh, QPCS. And uh, this is the parameter I mentioned previously. So PCS is what we call now surface potential. So it highlights effectively the bias that uh, is uh, applied across the semiconductor. While, as you can see, uh, Vox is the bias that is applied effectively across the, the oxide. Oh, what we are indicating now here is effectively that this uh, total uh, bias that was applied across the entire device that we called V is now split into parts, one across the oxide, one across the semiconductor. And uh, obviously, uh, in such a way, always that V is equal to Vox plus Cs. The reason this is happening is that while we have access directly to contact the metal and the far right end of the semiconductor, we don't have from outside access effectively to this interface. So this interface, or at least the potential of this interface, is effective floating. So the potential V that we applied across the device splits in two. Now it's hard to say at this very moment what they are. It's only by solving the Poisson equation uh, through the entire device that we could say what is really happening, or at least uh, uh, what, what their values are. Nevertheless, uh, with uh, this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, bending that we see, what we should expect is that uh, uh, because now the Fermi level very close to the interface is effectively going through or approaching uh, a lot the valence band, then the uh, majority carriers, we are in uh, P silicon, remember, so the, the, the holes are majority carriers, will now very happily accumulate even more toward the interface. So the interface is becoming even more P. And so we call this situation where the majority carriers are accumulated to the interface uh, uh, accumulation. So in the case of P-silicon, when V applied to the metal is negative, we are in a situation that we call accumulation. Oh, this is also uh, um, indicated by the fact that, as you see, PCS here is negative. Remember that Q is the charge of the electron, so it's negative. So this means that for the band bending to be like that, to go upward, this means that PCS is negative. So uh, accumulation is characterized by the fact that PCS is negative. And as we've uh, 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 said a moment ago, uh, uh, it means that the interface between the oxide and the semiconductor, what is happening is that the valence band is very close to the Fermi level. Oh, uh, 
Remember, this is for the case of a P silicon. If we now instead apply a positive bias, a slightly positive bias, what uh, we could expect is that uh, the, um, we have to uh, now pull downward uh, the uh, side of the energy diagram that corresponds to the metal. Remember, again, we have to keep these barriers uh, the same uh, through the process and uh, so we are pulling downward uh, um, the metal together with uh, effectively the interface of the oxide and so again this means that this bias is split across the oxide and the uh, semiconductor so the bias through the oxide originates some electric field uh, that I forgot to stress previously uh, uh, is highlighted by the fact that there is some slope as you can see here in the in the bands, conduction band and the valence band of the insulator um, and bends also the um, conduction and valence band of the semiconductor now in the way that I've shown here. Oh, if the voltage is not large enough uh, uh, then uh, uh, the bending is small and we could imagine that we are in a situation similar to the one I've shown here where effectively the band, is, the band bending is such that the near the interface, effectively, the intrinsic energy of the semiconductor is close to the Fermi level. This effectively means that very close to the interface, the semiconductor is intrinsic. So, in this situation, we have effectively depleted the majority carriers away, and obviously the minority carriers are so few that they are nearly negligible and so they, we can consider the semiconductor effectively depleted. And so we are in a situation where we, that we call depletion. So depletion is uh, um, represented by the fact that uh, the OS interface is such that the intrinsic energy of the semiconductor is very close to the actual bulk Fermi energy of the semiconductor, as I've shown here in the diagram. And in terms of Ps value, uh, this effectively means that Ps is equal to Pcf, uh, where Pcf is defined, if you remember, in the way that uh, I've shown here. We had seen this definition also in the very first slide of the MOS device uh, uh, that we've seen here previously. And so it is effectively related to the difference between the actual Fermi level of the semiconductor we are using and the uh, intrinsic uh, Fermi level of the semiconductor. So when Pcs is equal to Pcf, the bending is such that uh, uh, we, are, we are in depletion. Oh, uh, just to be a bit more precise, uh, we could say that uh, uh, actually the depletion exists for uh, Pcs values that range between 0 and 2 Pcf. And uh, um, if this is Pcf, this is 2 Pcf, and this is zero, uh, we could imagine that within this area here we are effectively uh, leaving accumulation and we are entering depletion and then as we move now toward to PCF we leave depletion and we start moving into inversion as we will see in a moment. So if we keep increasing the voltage, uh, uh, our positive voltage, uh, and, the, and the, the voltage becomes uh, larger and larger, then we effectively are, we keep pulling downward uh, the uh, metal side with the interface part of the uh, our uh, energy diagram. And so we end up with a situation as the one depicted here. Uh, so again, obviously the voltage, uh, the total voltage difference draw, uh, um, splits between uh, uh, the oxide and the semiconductor. And uh, in this case now the 
uh, band bending is such that effectively uh, uh, the, uh, the minority carriers now are very happily uh, moving downhill toward the interface and they actually now are uh, accumulating uh, to the interface. The, this situation is the one that we call uh, inversion, where effectively uh, where the bulk of the material is uh, in this case P, but very close to the interface, effectively the material can be considered N due to the accumulation of the minority carriers there. And so uh, for this uh, P-type semiconductor, uh, what we have is that inversion is characterized by the fact that at the oxide semiconductor interface, the conduction band is close to the Fermi level of the bulk. And uh, the, in terms of PCS, we could say that inversion is uh, identified by the fact that PCS is uh, uh, bigger than 2 PCF. Oh, we can summarize uh, the things that we've uh, um, just uh, described through our energy diagrams with this uh, nice plot for a p-type uh, silicon semiconductor where we are uh, showing the absolute value of the charge uh, density accumulated uh, uh, at the interface between the oxide and the semiconductor for different values of PCS. So you can see when PCS is negative, the uh, accumulated charge is large. Obviously, in this case, it's positive because we are in accumulation and this type of semiconductor is P. And then uh, uh, as soon as PCS is between uh, uh, 0 and PCB, remember that PCB for us is also PCF, according to our uh, formalism. Um, and so um, the charge accumulated at the interface is obviously it's small uh, um, because we are in depletion, as we said. And uh, um, uh, we are, so this is the region that I mentioned previously. So very close to zero, we are effectively moving away from uh, um, um, accumulation and entering the depletion region. And uh, then as we go beyond uh, PCF, it is here, uh, we start moving into weak inversion and then uh, as soon as we uh, reach 2PCF, we move into inversion and so the charge density again starts increasing a lot as we are into now well into inversion. So you can uh, uh, remind yourself uh, the um, uh, symbols we've used uh, in this uh, uh, diagram here. And uh, um, while on this side, uh, what I'm showing you is um, uh, some equations that uh, relate the density of electrons and holes at the interface as related to the densities in the bulk of the semiconductor by using the uh, uh, surface potential that here is indicated just by Psi. And uh, uh, by using the uh, equations that we've um, uh, revised uh, some time ago regarding uh, semiconductors, uh, we can demonstrate that this is actually the uh, Poisson equation or maybe the uh, equation that uh, results from uh, the Poisson equation applied to our uh, semiconductor uh, where a uh, surface potential C exists. So by solving this equation effectively we could uh, um, solve, uh, we could calculate or estimate the surface potential. Oh, remember always that uh, uh, um, as we've said many times now, the applied voltage across the entire device V always splits in two. So there is a voltage drop across the insulator, the ox, through the oxide, and there is a, a, a potential drop across the semiconductor that we've highlighted by the definition of uh, PCS.
So here we summarize what we've uh, uh, said uh, up until now. So when PCS is zero, we are in a flat band situation. Uh, when PCS is uh, equal to PCF, we are in depletion. And uh, uh, the value of PCF can be calculated like that. You can go back and see this uh, effectively formula is uh, stated, on, I think, on uh, slide uh, 65 or so of, uh, of the notes where we uh, uh, revise uh, the fundamental equations of uh, semiconductors and uh, and then when uh, instead the PCS is equal to 2PCF and above uh, then uh, we are in inversion. Now the MOS uh, system is particularly important within uh, uh, the framework of uh, the operation of a, a MOSFET transistor because the MOS device that sits on top effectively of our transistor is the one that uh, pilots the operation of the transistor whether the, the transistor is on or is off as we will see and it does that through its capacitance and through the formation of the accumulation or inversion layers that we've uh, discussed now. So it is extremely important to understand uh, what capacitance we should expect from an MOS device. Given what we said until now, that uh, there are uh, also uh, depletion layers and so on and so forth. So let us start our analysis by looking at uh, the uh, uh, accumulation condition. So for a p-type semiconductor this means that the voltage is negative or that uh, equivalently the surface potential is negative. So in this case we can refer to the uh, energy diagram in this situation that we have drawn here. The accumulation condition is represented by the fact that we are effectively accumulating majority carriers to the interface. These are really a lot of uh, carriers and so effectively the capacitance of our device C is effectively the capacitance of the oxide uh, that we can calculate by uh, um, through this formula epsilon ox over t ox or remember this is a, a capacitance per unit area as you can see we are not uh, uh, um, writing ex explicitly uh, a in the formula so this means that this capacitance is a capacitance per unit area or if we analyze in depth the accumulation condition then uh, we could demonstrate that uh, the width of the accumulation region, so effectively the region where we have all these uh, majority carriers effectively accumulated, uh, could be calculated uh, or estimated through this formula here. As you can see, this uh, depends on, uh, on, on PCS, and uh, in this specific case, uh, PCS can vary between uh, a zero and, uh, and this value here. Uh, LD is uh, again the, the by length that we've seen some time ago and we can also calculate the accumulated charge through this formula here. When we consider the depletion uh, situation, which if you remember for uh, a p-type uh, um, semiconductor means that the voltage is close to zero, slightly positive, and the surface potential is around PCS or between zero and PCS, PCF. Effectively, the energy diagram of the device will look something like that. And so uh, uh, the total capacitance in this case is given by the capacitance of the oxide, but we need to consider also the presence of uh, uh, now the depletion layer there. And so effectively our device is um, something like this now. So we have our oxide, but also now the depletion layer. And so in reality, uh, the equivalent circuit, if you like, of, uh, of our device is uh, um, uh, the series of two capacitors, Cox and Cd. And so that's why the total capacitance is actually given by uh, this formula here. So this means that the total capacitance is actually lower than Cox in this case.
And uh, we can also calculate the depletion layer using uh, um, um, arguments similar to those that we've used for the MS contact and the PN junction. So uh, we can demonstrate that the depletion layer is given by this formula here and uh, the depletion capacitance in the end is effectively given by this formula here. This follows very closely what we've done uh, for MS contacts. And finally, we consider the most interesting case of inversion. Uh, remember that inversion uh, for a p-type material happens when we, the voltage is quite positive and uh, the surface potential is uh, uh, above PCF, uh, beyond even uh, 2 PCF effectively. Now, the inversion situation is particularly interesting because uh, we've said that in inversion we have minority carriers accumulated at the interface between the oxide and the semiconductor. Now, uh, remember the minority carriers are generally extremely low in density in the bulk of the material, but because we are in inversion, they are effectively accumulating at the interface, and so locally the density of, uh, uh, of minority carriers is extremely high, as we said. So high that the uh, material, as we've highlighted previously, can actually be considered inverted in type. So if the material was in the bulk uh, P, maybe at the interface is actually now N. This is uh, 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 obviously extraordinary, if you like, and, uh, and um, uh, this also uh, relates to what we are about to say uh, uh, and relates to the fact that the inversion situation in terms of what capacitance we should expect um, is uh, effectively uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, in order to understand well uh, what um, uh, we are about to say about the capacitance, we should remind that uh, um, in a semiconductor, the density of electrons and the density of holes is actual the result of the dynamic generation and, and the recombination of these carriers. So, the density of holes and the density of electron is effectively a constant, if you like, in a, if, I, if I take a piece of semiconductor, but is actually the result of a continuous uh, uh, generation and uh, recombination of these uh, uh, two carriers. And this is what we have to consider uh, when we try to understand uh, uh, what the capacitance does uh, uh, in an MOS device in inversion. In order to properly understand what uh, uh, we should expect in inversion, uh, let us remind ourselves what capacitance is very quickly and especially how do we measure the capacitance. So if you remember uh, when we defined the concept of capacitance, uh, we use uh, um, a circuit that is the, like the one that I've shown here. We imagine our uh, parallel plate capacitor uh, that is uh, attached to a battery with a voltage difference V. So a positive charge appears on this plate, uh, an equivalent negative charge appears on the other plate because of uh, electrostatic induction. And so there is an internal electric field directed like that, and we can demonstrate that the total capacitance is this one. And so what we are doing here is we are applying a DC voltage that is constant in time, and so in this situation we, we, we are effectively defining the capacitance using direct current conditions. How do we measure, though, the capacitance? What we have to do in order to measure the capacitance is that we have to use alternating currents. So we have to uh, ap apply an alternating voltage, measure the amplitude of the resulting uh, alternating current, and so use uh, the impedance concept to relate those quantities to the capacitance. And so we can calculate the capacitance finally through this formula here, where omega is the angular frequency that is given by 2p, 2 pi f, where f is the frequency of the alternating voltage that have, uh, or 
or current equivalent that I've used. Oh, we can uh, reconstruct the DC limit that we've uh, uh, defined up here by uh, sending omega towards zero. Uh, so uh, this DC limit uh, built in this way, as I've just described, by sending omega to zero is called uh, uh, the quasi-static condition. So in general, what we are saying here is that the capacitance of a capacitor, of a real capacitor, in general could be a function of uh, the frequency. Obviously, if we are dealing with an ideal capacitor, the capacitance will be a constant, independent of frequency. But in general, what this uh, formula here is suggesting is that the capacitance could be uh, a, a function of, uh, of the frequency. And this is exactly what we are about to discover with our uh, um, uh, MOS device, at least in inversion. So, let us consider now our MOS uh, device that uh, uh, practically is made uh, in the way that uh, I've shown here. Is a, there is a piece of metal that is in contact with a piece of, uh, of uh, insulator and then there is a piece of uh, semiconductor doped either P or N. In our case, probably, uh, we are using the P-type. And this is equivalent to a capacitance, but this is a very special capacitance. Indeed, this capacitance depends on the voltage, as we've already anticipated by looking at the accumulation and depletion region, where the voltage V is uh, the one that we've uh, uh, mentioned previously, is a DC bias. Okay, so it's direct current, it's constant in time, and is applied between the metal and the semiconductor side. So between here and here. By recalling what we said just a moment ago, that in general, to measure the capacitance of a device, I need to apply an alternating signal with a certain frequency. And uh, together with the fact that in an MOS device, I need to polarize my MOS device properly in one region or another, accumulation, depletion, or inversion, and this will influence the, the capacitance that I get. This means that then, in, an, in the case of MOS devices, to properly measure the capacitance, what I need to do is to use a very special signal, a, a, a voltage V that is a function of T, and is made by the superposition of a DC signal plus an AC signal. So my DC signal is this one here in red, and my AC signal is uh, this one here. So just for the formalism, uh, as you see, when, when, when you see V, this means uh, the DC voltage used to polarize the MOS device, where, where you, while when you see V tilde, this means the small a C signal used to probe the capacitance at a given uh, frequency. So effectively, uh, uh, when we are talking of MOS devices, we are always talking of uh, signals applied to uh, uh, the device that have the shape that I've shown here. Because, as, I, as I've said, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I would like to stress, we need a DC signal to polarize our device, either in accumulation, depletion, or inversion, and then we need an alternating signal to probe the capacitance in that situation. Going back to what we were saying uh, uh, previously uh, uh, regarding the inversion uh, situation, and the fact that uh, the carriers in a semiconductor are the results of uh, generation and recombination events and the dynamic equilibrium related to this uh, continuous phenomena. So if my uh, uh, MOS device is polarized into the inversion condition, so the voltage applied, the DC voltage applied is positive, as we said previously, and uh, the frequency of the AC signal that I'm using in order to probe the capacitance is low, extremely low, eventually, 
which means imagine we are approaching the quasi-static limit, then the minority carriers that are highly accumulated at the interface of uh, uh, my uh, oxide semiconductor interface will be able to respond to this alternating electric field. And so this means that effectively the real uh, capacitor is represented by the insulator that exists in our MOS device. And so the capacitance uh, uh, should be simply C ox in that case. So if the frequency is low. But if the frequency of my um, of my AC signal that I'm using to probe the capacitance is very high, say for example one megahertz, then the the what happens is that the minority carriers that are accumulated near the interface effectively are, are transparent to this very quickly changing electric field. So they don't respond to that. They can't respond. And this is related to uh, uh, what I was saying previously to the generation and recombination dynamic. So effectively, what will respond to this uh, 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 quickly changing electric field are only the majority carriers that are very far, far away into the bulk of the semiconductor. And so we have, in this case, the existence of a depletion region. And so now the capacitance is lower than C-ox because we have both uh, to consider uh, uh, C-ox and the, the capacitance of the depletion region. So effectively, in this case, we have a lower capacitance. So this is when uh, uh, the frequency is uh, low and this is when the frequency is high. These results are summarized uh, in uh, one of, in this slide here. So in accumulation, we said that the capacitance is equal to C-ox, the capacitance of the just the oxide for every frequency we use. In deflation, uh, we said that the capacitance is given by the combination of the capacitance of the oxide and the capacitance of the depletion layer for all frequencies again. In inversion, uh, though, uh, we have that the capacitance of the device will be just the capacitance of the insulator if we are at low frequencies, or it will be equal to a minimum capacitance when we are at uh, high frequencies. And uh, this minimum capacitance is uh, calculated uh, in the way that I've uh, indicated down here. Again, we have, uh, because we have a depletion uh, layer, the de depletion width can be estimated uh, in this way, and so the minimum capacitance can be calculated in this way. So, putting everything together now, we can plot the um, capacitance voltage characteristic of our MOS device, obviously in the case of a P-silicon uh, substrate, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, capacitance voltage characteristic has the shape shown here. Or remember that the voltage we are plotting here is the DC voltage that we use to polarize the MOS device. So, uh, uh, as we can see, uh, for negative voltages, we have uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, capacitor is uh, in accumulation, or note that here what we are plotting is uh, C over CI, where CI in this uh, uh, graph is uh, the capacitance of the insulator, so the capacitor of the oxide. So in our formalism, this is C over C ox. So uh, uh, the, for negative biases, we are in accumulation, and then uh, as we approach the voltage uh, equal zero, we move into the depletion. As you can see, this point here is what we've uh, called uh, flat band situation. 
according to the assumption we had made, remember that the Fermi levels are all uh, aligned, uh, which we are going to drop in a moment. So uh, uh, we move into the depletion, and then at this point, if we are in uh, uh, the signal used to probe the capacitance is a high frequency signal, then the capacitance is uh, C minimum. So we are down here. So this is at high frequency. Oh, this, remember, is the frequency of the uh, small AC signal that I'm using to probe the capacitance. And uh, this one here is when uh, if the capacitance, sorry, if, if the frequency though is low enough, quite low, uh, uh, nearly close to the DC limit, then uh, the curve would be this one here. And this is what we call the quasi, excuse me, quasi static limit. Oh, for the frequencies that are in between, we would get all the situations that are in between. So we should expect that if we start increasing uh, slightly the frequency, we go there. If we increase further, we go there, and so on and so forth. So we should expect something like that, that the plot changes gradually from uh, one to the other situation. As we've anticipated previously, the capacitance of our MOS device is what effectively drives the operation of the MOSFET device, as we will see later on. So it is very important to, uh, first of all, understand uh, this uh, CV uh, plot and understand especially what could influence this plot, what could change it potentially, what factors could affect it. And that is exactly what we are going to discuss now. So the first thing we want to discuss is what could be the effect of a Fermi levels mismatch. So let us drop the unrealistic assumption we made previously that uh, in our MOS devices, all materials we are considering all have the same Fermi level. This is obviously unrealistic. And in the most general case, we should expect that between the Fermi level of the metal and the Fermi level of the semiconductor, there is a mismatch that I've indicated here as Q delta VFB. So using exactly the same, same arguments that we've used in the uh, metal semiconductor contacts, uh, what has to happen is that the Fermi levels have to uh, uh, become the same throughout the device once we bring the three materials together. And so this is uh, um, this effectively uh, trans translates into the creation of, uh, uh, of the appearance of band bending. And so uh, uh, we end up with this situation here, where uh, we, as you can see, effectively, uh, if you remember, this is exactly what we did also in the MS contact, this mismatch here translates into the band bending of the uh, conduction and valence band in the semiconductor. And so this means that in order to achieve flat band condition, now that we have a uh, Fermi level mismatch in the, in the MOS device, we need now to apply some potential on the metal. And uh, this potential we need to apply is exactly delta VFB, the one that related to the mismatch in Fermi uh, uh, level energies. And so if we apply that, you can see that the, the bands uh, are now flat in the semiconductor, and uh, the only thing we have is uh, now obviously an electric field into the into the semi into the oxide. In terms of our CV plot, the capacitance voltage characteristic of our MOS device, this effectively means now that the flat band condition is not happening anymore uh, at zero voltage as it used uh, when we had uh, it, as it used to do when we had our unrealistic assumption 
uh, that we had made previously, uh, but now will happen at uh, a voltage that is shifted from that by a quantity, a quantity delta F VFB. And this is highlighted here in this uh, 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 plots. So initially, our when we had our unrealistic assumption, uh, the CV plot had uh, the flat band condition in this point here, when the voltage was zero, and uh, so PCS was by definition zero. But now that uh, the, we are considering a Fermi level mismatch, there must be a certain delta VFB that in, in this case is negative. As you can see, we have to uh, pull the, the metal side upward, so delta VFB is negative. And so this means that the entire CV plot is shifting now uh, by a quantity delta VFB in the direction that I've shown here. In this case and in the uh, other cases that we're going to see in a moment, the delta VFB translates always into a shift in one direction or another of the CV plot of my uh, MOS device. Another thing we need to uh, take into account uh, uh, if we want to uh, consider more realistic uh, MOS devices is the effect of traps. The importance of this is that traps are effectively states. States that can uh, uh, attract or trap uh, um, charges, either positive or negative. And charges have uh, uh, very important effects on the operation of uh, our MOS system. Here, what we will discuss are mainly the traps that uh, we may find in the oxide layer, so in the insulator layer, or at the, at the interfaces between this oxide layer and the uh, semiconductor or the metal. So, uh, <clears throat> the, the main origin of um, oxide traps are uh, um, dangling bonds, some bonds that have not been formed in the, uh, for example, uh, insulator matrix. So if we are talking about silicon dioxide, for example, there will be missing bonds between silicon and oxygen atoms. Or also we can uh, have vacancies. So maybe there is a, an atom missing within the matrix. Or we may have even impurities. So, uh, um, uh, atoms that are uh, not uh, silicon and not oxygen. Oh, these, uh, 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 the first two cases of dangling bonds and vagancies are depicted in the two pictures, uh, uh, images down here, as you can see. We can uh, categorize the traps in two uh, types. Uh, interface traps, so traps that are uh, located physically in terms of uh, their position at the interface, either between the oxide and the semiconductor or between the oxide and the metal. We will see that those that are extremely important and extremely dangerous are those that are between the oxide and the semiconductor that we will discuss later in a moment. And then uh, uh, bulk traps. So traps that are effectively located within the bulk of the insulator. Um, we should uh, um, highlight here that uh, the traps we've just discussed uh, that arise from dangling bonds or uh, vacancies or impurities, uh, from the quantum mechanical point of view, appear in our energy diagram as states located generally uh, between uh, within the forbidden region of our insulator. So in the region that is between the valence band and the conduction band. In this slide you can uh, uh, visually see uh, the example of um, interface traps and uh, bulk traps. So you can see here the interface traps 
uh, located either at the, this interface or uh, this interface here. Uh, while in this case, what I've drawn is the example of, uh, of bulk traps. So traps that are located within the, uh, semi, the insulator and in the, in the forbidden region uh, between the conduction band and the valence band of the insulator. Or here as insulator, and you will see it uh, uh, many times in the next uh, slides. We our insulator is the silicon dioxide, and uh, the the semiconductor is silicon. Let us uh, start our exploration uh, uh, from uh, the effect of uh, bulk traps. So let us imagine the situation where uh, we have our metal uh, uh, oxide uh, semiconductor system and uh, uh, we have some positive charge, uh, a point charge Q positive located at a certain distance X from uh, the metal side. And uh, uh, T ox is the total thickness of the oxide. So, using simple electrostatic uh, um, arguments, we can demonstrate, and we will do it in a moment, that uh, uh, there will be some negative charge induced into the metal and some negative charge induced into the silicon. Oh, this means that the presence of this charge here, by inducing a negative charge into the silicon, will automatically mean that the the, the bands in the silicon, in the, in my semiconductor material are effectively bent. This is, uh, the result we came across, uh, uh, or we maybe realized, uh, uh, some, a few slides ago, if you remember, when we were, uh, 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 dealing with, uh, metal semiconductor contacts. So the presence of this charge here means that the bands of the semiconductor are bent and so this means that my device that is effectively uh, uh, in equilibrium has no bias uh, applied to it uh, is not in flat band condition so uh, effectively what we have to do in order to create the flat band condition in the semiconductor side is that we have to increase the negative charge into the metal until uh, the uh, there is no need anymore to have a negative charge into the silicon in order to counterbalance, if you like, the charge that uh, the point charge that is uh, within uh, the insulator. And this is what this uh, uh, um, diagram here is showing. So if I imagine now to increase the amount, the negative charge on the metal, uh, we could achieve finally flat band condition on the silicon. So this means that we need to apply some uh, external potential effectively to the metal in order to achieve flat band condition if we have a positive charge into the metal, into the insulator. And we can demonstrate, and we'll do it in a moment, that uh, this positive, this uh, uh, external bias is given by this formula here. So a minus the charge that uh, is uh, within the insulator divided by the C ox time <coughs> x over T ox, where x is, remember, the distance of the point charge from the metal. That we can write uh, uh, elegantly in this way, introducing the factor gamma, where gamma is uh, uh, dependent from these uh, geometrical factors here. Oh, in order to demonstrate uh, uh, this, oh, we've already qualitatively explained this, but uh, in order to demonstrate it qu quantitatively, uh, we should consider simple electrostatic arguments. And that's what I'm doing here. So imagine that uh, uh, we have our charge Q, as we said previously, uh, within our, uh, our insulator at a distant X from the metal, then effectively if we go back for a moment to our diagram, the, the, this first diagram here, we can see here uh, split our uh, our device in two. So we would have a first capacitance here and the second capacitor capacitor there. And uh, the charge Q would sit on the two plates 
of uh, uh, these two capacitors in the way that I've uh, drawn here. So effectively we have the first capacitor that has a thickness X and we call C1 and the second capacitor C2 with a thickness uh, Th ox minus X and uh, the total charge Q is now we could imagine split into a charge Q1 that sits on the plate of the left capacitor and Q2 on the plate on the right capacitor and uh, with the condition that Q1 plus Q2 is equal Q, the point charge that we had placed uh, in that point. So by electrostatic induction we should expect that on the on this plate here we have a charge minus Q1, on this plate here we have a charge minus Q2 and so we can now uh, uh, use uh, uh, simple uh, electrostatic results to try and analyze and calculate how much would be in equilibrium Q1 and Q2 and so how much charge we should expect in equilibrium on this plate and on this plate effectively. And so that's what we are doing here. So remember that uh, uh, the definition of capacitance uh, says that Q, uh, sorry, C is equal to Q over delta V applied across the plates and uh, C1 is uh, given by these values here and the C ox, the total capacitance of our insulator is given by the combination of uh, these two capacitances C1 and C2 and obviously given by this. So, um, by using uh, all these uh, results, um, we could s calculate delta V1 that is given by effectively VA minus VB, where uh, A, B, C and D are the points that uh, are, I've indicated here. Or remember that B and C effectively represents the same point in space and so they are effectively equipotential. Okay, so wherever you see VB and VC, they are effectively the same potential. So delta V1 is VA minus VB, is the potential difference across the first capacitor, and so this is given by uh, minus Q1 over C1. Delta V2 correspondingly is given by uh, this formula here. And then now we uh, consider the fact that we are in equilibrium, and so we have to impose that the total voltage difference uh, between this point and this point has to be zero. And so uh, this means that VA minus VD has to be zero, which we translate as delta V1 plus delta V2 must be zero. And so we end up with this system here, where uh, uh, the top one is the condition that we just mentioned, that uh, uh, delta V1 plus delta V2 must be zero, and uh, 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 we need to impose the condition that Q1 plus Q2 uh, is Q. So this is a very simple uh, system that we can solve very quickly, and uh, we can uh, end up with uh, the final result shown here, that Q1 is equal to this value here, and Q2 is given by this value here. This is uh, telling us what is the charge effectively on uh, on, uh, on this plate here and on this plate here. And so uh, by changing the sign to, 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 to those results, we can get the charge into the metal induced into the metal and the charge induced into the semiconductor. So we can uh, see that uh, uh, the induced charge, the amount of induced charge depends on the actual position of the point charge Q, depends on X. So let us now uh, calculate what should be the potential, the external potential that we've called delta VQ that we need to apply to the metal contact in such a way that the charge into the semiconductor is zero. So effectively, in such a way that the charge on the plates of the second capacitor is zero. So the first relation here is effectively the one that we had written also in this case here, 
but now is not anymore equal to zero, but we want it to be equal to delta VQ, which is the uh, potential we are aiming to find. We still remember that, uh, obviously, the total Q is Q1 plus Q2, but now we have also this condition here. So, pretty quickly, we can uh, end up with this result here. And if we now remember that C1 can be written in this way, then we can uh, quickly end up with this general results that is exactly the one that we had anticipated previously in our slide. So the presence of a charge into my device means that in order to achieve flat band, and remember that here flat band is represented by imposing this condition, that there is no charge within, induced within uh, the semiconductor. Uh, the, the voltage we need to apply is given by this formula here. In case the charge is not a point charge, but is actually a, a, a distribution, so in presence of a, a charge distribution rho within the insulator, uh, the result, the final result is always the same, as you can see. Uh, simply is a, is a bit slightly more complicated, the calculation. So uh, we still have that the voltage is given by minus gamma Q in the oxide over C ox, but now Q ox is actually the integral of the charge distribution, and gamma is slightly more complicated uh, because effectively is given by uh, still X divided by the ox, but this x now has a different meaning, meaning it is actually the charge centroid given by this ratio here. So it's the integral of x rho in the x divided by the total uh, uh, oxide charge. But you can see that overall the formula remains effectively the same. So, uh, all this is telling us that in presence of uh, bulk traps, bulk charges in my MOS system, I should expect a shift in the flat band condition. And so, this is going to shift my CV curve, uh, as I've shown in these two plots, to highlight what happens when the oxide trapped charge is positive, or when the oxide trap charge is negative. So in, in, in this case, the shift is toward the negative side of the voltage axis, uh, while in, the, in this case here, the shift is toward the positive side of the axis. This is still, remember, for the case of a P-silicon, P-type semiconductor. Oh. The shift in the CV characteristic of my MOS device is not the only thing that uh, we should expect from uh, the presence of bulk traps, or generally traps within my insulator. Indeed, uh, 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 there is also a very important effect that is the band bending due to discharges. And we will demonstrate it uh, very quickly here uh, uh, by solving the Boston negation in one uh, uh, simple case. So let us imagine that uh, we have uh, a, a very simple device. It's not an MOS device for simplicity. Uh, it's uh, um, what we would call a MIM device, a metal insulator metal. As you can see, we have an aluminum contact, uh, uh, an insulator in the middle that in this case is silicon dioxide, for example, and an, another aluminum contact. So metal insulator metal. And uh, uh, the insulator has a thickness of uh, D, and our X axis uh, starts at the metal insulator interface, and uh, and uh, um, at X equal D we reach the interface between the insulator and the other metal on the other end. So, in case we have some oxide charge, what we have to do? 
we need to solve the Poisson equation within the insulator, considering the uh, charge di distribution row of the oxide charges and imposing the boundary condition that uh, the potential on the left hand side of the device and on the right hand side must be zero. In, the, in this case, uh, we are uh, assuming that there is no bias applied across the device, so the device is in, in equilibrium. And uh, we would like to find out what happens when suddenly some charge is placed within the insulator. So we are going to solve this in this uh, slide here. And the, the steps are extremely simple. So let us assume that uh, our uh, um, charge density is a constant. So we have a constant charge density uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, the insulator. We have some traps within the insulator and, and the, the charge density uh, throughout the insulator is constant. The charge density in these traps, because of these traps, is constant, as I've indicated here in this plot. And uh, we have uh, to impose the conditions, as you remember, that uh, the potential at the two ends of my uh, insulating layer must be zero. And so we have now to solve this equation here. And the way we solve it is effectively we integrate. We solve it by successive integration because this term is constant. And so we do these very simple integrations and we end up uh, with this uh, um, uh, formula here uh, where you can see now we have some constants that are related to the integration process and we can uh, uh, specify now uh, these constants by imposing uh, uh, the boundary conditions. So uh, here we use the first boundary condition at x equals 0 by imposing that uh, v ox at x equals 0 is 0 and so this means that f must be 0 and uh, here we deal with the other boundary conditions so that the potential at x equal d must be zero. And this means uh, that c must be equal to this value here. And so, uh, in the end, the solution of our Poisson equation is the one in this uh, uh, formula here. By using now the fact that uh, the energy of our electrons in the bands uh, is given by minus QV and V now across my insulator is given by this uh, uh, formula here, which effectively is a parabola. We uh, realize that uh, the potential energy of the electrons is actually given by this parabola here. Oh, remember the rho could be positive, could be negative. So depending on the sign of rho, the constant rho, um, we could have a parabola pointing upward or downward. Oh, remember that according to the formalism I'm using, Q is the, is, the, is the charge of the electron, but without the sign. So Q is positive, okay? And so this means that uh, if rho is negative, what we should expect is that the, the conduction and the valence band of my insulator are not flat anymore, but should be bent up uh, in, the, in this way. So the parabola for rho negative would be pointing downward. And so effectively, this means that uh, the presence of a negative charge within my insulator effectively pulls the bands upward. So this is another fundamental uh, result that we should always keep in mind to be able to quickly uh, uh, realize what happens within an energy diagram. So when we place a charge in any point within uh, uh, the energy diagram of, uh, of uh, a device, if the charge is negative, this immediately means that we have to pull upward the, the, the bands. The bands should bend uh, 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 in such a way that we are effectively pulling upward the bands. Or the opposite should happen if uh, the charge is uh, positive. Oh, so, uh, this result also indicate 
uh, another important result that we will come across uh, several times afterwards in, in the next few chapters. And this is that if we now place this uh, negative charge within our di band energy diagram, and so uh, the bands bend in the way that I've shown here, this effectively means that if there was here an electron that wanted to cross the insulator, because of the presence now of this negative charge within the insulator that is causing this band bending, this electron would find it harder now to cross. We can interpret this, one way to interpret this is that because this charge that we placed within the insulator is negative, uh, obviously this electron here will find it harder to cross because simply of Coulombic repulsion. But now another way to see this is that this electron sees now in front of uh, itself a larger barrier. So the barrier is now high, higher. And that's why uh, this electron will find it harder to cross our device. So this is uh, also uh, a result that we should uh, always keep in mind, uh, especially for uh, uh, the next chapters when we will deal uh, with non-volatile memories. Now, le let us have a look now at uh, interface traps. So um, interface traps arise because of the mismatch between uh, the lattice of the insulator and the lattice of the semiconductor, if we're talking of the oxide semiconductor interface. Uh, this is highlighted here uh, uh, by uh, showing uh, the lattice of the SiO2 um, uh, uh, insulator and uh, the lattice of uh, the silicon semiconductor. As you can see, there are some silicon bonds that are effectively dangling. They don't bond to any other atom of the insulator lattice. And so this creates an interfacial trap. It is the density of these uh, uh, traps, interface traps, that we quantify with a uh, parameter that we call uh, DIT, density of interface states. For uh, a silicon, silicon dioxide uh, interface, uh, uh, we should expect a uh, density of 10 to the 10 states per square centimeter and dV. This is how we quantify these uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, interface states. Or oh, this is considered a low value. Uh, and uh, this uh, value is obtained only by passivating the interfacial traps. So by processing uh, the um, device with uh, special uh, gases and um, techniques that allow effectively to uh, passivate uh, these interfacial traps to some extent. Because otherwise, if we consider uh, um, an uh, unpassivated silicon, silicon dioxide system, the density of interface states could be much larger, of the order of 10 to the 14. So, uh, uh, because, as we will see in a moment, the interface states have a, a, an extremely detrimental uh, effect on the semiconductor, uh, we have to do uh, everything we can to uh, keep the uh, density of interface states as low as possible. Oh, we should uh, uh, highlight here that um, um, the reason why historically uh, silicon has um, dominated effectively over germanium is not because silicon is a, a very good uh, uh, semiconductor, not at all. Germanium is a much better semiconductor, but uh, uh, because 
silicon as an extremely good uh, oxide. And when they are put together, they create a very good interface. So the silicon, silicon dioxide system is uh, the combination that provides overall the best uh, performance, if you like. Oh, let us uh, have a look now to what we briefly anticipated uh, a few minutes ago, uh, that uh, um, why um, interface states uh, are so detrimental to the operation of uh, our MOS system or in general any device that is based on MOS system. And uh, the, the reason is highlighted here in this uh, slide. So our um, interface traps are those indicated by this, uh, this dash uh, uh, symbol on the interface between the oxide and the semiconductor. When we are in accumulation, the energy level, if we are considering a P-silicon uh, semiconductor, uh, the, the Fermi level uh, is uh, located uh, somewhere here and uh, uh, near to the interface, as we said, the uh, uh, valence band eff effectively would be very close or even above the Fermi level. And so this means that uh, only the states the interface states that lie below the Fermi level can potentially be filled with an electron. And I've indicated them with the red. As we move from accumulation to depletion, we can see that the, the Fermi level effectively uh, is uh, changing its relative position compared to the to the, to the valence band and the conduction band, at least at the interface with the, with the insulator. And so more interface states can be filled. And as we move to inversion, uh, uh, nearly all the interface states can be filled now. So we can see that uh, the charge that is trapped into interface states actually changes dynamically as we change the uh, uh, voltage, the DC voltage that we use to polarize uh, the, the MOS device. So it is exactly this phenomenon that is extremely detrimental. As we operate, as we polarize uh, our uh, uh, MOS device, the QIT, the interface trapped uh, charge, dynamically changes. And the effect of this is uh, highlighted here in these three points. So the first effect is that uh, there is a less steep CV characteristic. And this is a direct consequence of this dynamic charging and discharging of these interface states because of the phenomenon I've just uh, uh, explained to you. Secondly, uh, we should expect a shift in the CV characteristic, if we have some charge in the insulator, even if at the interface with the uh, semiconductor, we should ex expect a, a flat band voltage shift. And uh, actually, this flat band voltage shift can be calculated effectively in this way. And third, uh, we may observe uh, hysteresis in the CV characteristic. When we uh, sweep the CV characteristic either forward or backward, as, as it is indicated on this uh, uh, plot here, you can see that uh, we are imagining to go forward and we get this uh, characteristic here when we are moving in the forward direction from negative to positive uh, biases. And then when we come back, we would go back over this curve. So we can see there is a hysteresis here. There is a separation between the forward and backward characteristic. And this is due to the fact that when we start from the negative side and we move in a forward direction, we're effectively moving from the accumulation toward the inversion. And so we move from a situation where uh, the charge, the, the, the interface states are all filled 
when we instead move in the backward direction, that means we start from here, from the inversion condition, and we move toward the accumulation, we start from a situation where all the interface traps are empty or nearly empty. And it is this difference in the, big, in the starting condition that, are, uh, that causes this hysteresis effect. So, uh, concluding uh, our exploration of uh, the uh, operation of the MOS device, uh, we can uh, um, uh, summarize finally that in a real uh, uh, MOS uh, system, uh, uh, the, the, we should expect more in general that uh, the flatbed condition is found in our CV characteristic at uh, uh, voltage VFB that is given by three contributions. The first one that is related to the uh, Fermi level mismatch, the second one that is related to the presence of some uh, oxide charge, and the third one related to the presence of uh, uh, interface states. Oh, please note that here I think a gamma is missing. Oh, this concludes uh, this uh, um, fourth chapter. So thank you for uh, listening and uh, uh, see you next time.